Hey y'all, it's Chad, pastor here at Foundry. I wanna welcome you to worship this weekend. We've got a fantastic Sunday planned for you. I'm sharing a message about spiritual inheritance. We're continuing our series in 1 Peter entitled Belonging, uh, so that we know who we are in Christ. We've also got some fun announcements. We got some great worship from our brand new full-time director of worship arts, Madeline Ringwald. I've had the privilege of kind of enjoying getting a chance to play a little bit of guitar during Corona, something I don't normally get to do. Uh, but we've got a fantastic uh, Sunday today, but it's all about Jesus. It's about Jesus being big enough. It's about that no matter where we are, where we are, that his power reigns over our life and that he invites us into a life with him that's bigger than anything we could ever imagine. So let's start worshiping together today. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, I'm Amy Wiggins. Welcome to Foundry. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Before we get started, I just want to point out a few ways that you can connect with us digitally. At Foundry, we join together with an organization called REACH. We check in on Facebook each Sunday, and together with hundreds of other churches, we make a serious impact. This month, our check-ins go to fund efforts for COVID relief. If this is your first time worshiping with Foundry and you live in the Sterlington Monroe area, we would love for you to fill out the digital connection card. That way we can reach out to you to give you some seriously fun Foundry swag. Thanks again for worshiping with us this Sunday. Please share the video. Now let's get started. Hey friends, it's Chad here. I'm with my friend Madeline. You know, many of you know that uh, we made an announcement recently and that Madeline has come on board at Foundry as our very first full-time director of worship. We're incredibly excited about that. Can't imagine what it's like to, uh, to be finishing college, to be starting a full-time job in the middle of Corona land. But Madeline, it's so good to have you here today. I'm really glad to be here, Chad, and um, I'm really excited to be able to get to know everybody um, whenever the time officially comes for us to be able to do so. Um, Chad and I have known each other for a little while, and I got to come up, and uh, for those of y'all that were at the Ash Wednesday service, I got to come and do that. And it so one of the things that Madeline and I have talked about a lot is just where does our heart, where are our hearts right now in worship and, and selecting some songs that are different for us, but really trying to speak in just the emotional level that we feel like people are at right now. Yeah. Um, like, like, where do you see that as, Madeline? I think making sure that we cater towards seeing what um, Foundry as a congregation wants to be doing, um, but then also recognizing that music has a very powerful um, ability to be able to touch... <laughs> touch us in a way that we are not used to with, with normal words. Um, and so being able to kind of create that environment of, of being able to come and to be vulnerable and to be able to, um, to be able to have a relationship with God through music. And I think that that's one of my biggest things about worship is being able to come, come as we are um, and be able to do this. And you don't have to sound good and it doesn't have to be perfect, but that uh, being able to create that space for us during this time when, when we're all, kind of up in the air at the moment yeah so yeah and so you know we're about to sing a song that's just about the stability that Christ provides no matter what oh. and what that is so uh, let's sing together this morning wherever you are uh, just make the space for Jesus to be right in the middle of your life Christ
song that we're going to do next is um, I grew up in in a church where we played a lot of the a lot of the late 90s early 2000s um, hits in Christian music and so I'm pretty familiar with those and so we've got this big like stigma in in worship world right now where we're trying to move away from that into into more new and, and bigger and and louder and larger worship um about like corporate worship but the thing about it is that's done away with right now you know we we can't we can't gather like that right now we can't do the big lights and the sound and, and the everything else and I thought back to this song that I, I've known since my childhood um, and how relevant the the message of it is right now and, and the story behind it is the guy the guy that wrote this song in his local church that he was at back in like the late 90s, he was playing this song and he wrote it because in his congregation, um, during the time when worship was starting to get really, really big, his pastor completely did away with big worship for a period of time. They got rid of the lights and the sound and the fancy stuff and all the, and all the extra that we now put into worship and he just stripped it back and put it to where it was just voices for a period of time, for a season in their church's life. Because he wanted to get back to why it was we were doing what we were doing rather than it just being the big shebang, rather than it just being the big show. And I think that that speaks so true to where we're at right now. We can't gather like that. We can't gather for big worship. We can't gather together um, for the big thing in, in church on Sunday morning. It's, it's getting back to the relationship that we have to come to at the end of the day with God that is separate from the show that is church sometimes. Um, and the beginning lyrics of this song are when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come. And then in the chorus it says, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing that I've made it. And I think that that's going to be a beautiful, beautiful picture to be able to paint moving forward is what do we want this to look like? 
when we really get back to the heart of what is going on and what worship is really about. It's about giving ourselves to God in a way that is very unique and very special. So, we're gonna go ahead and sing the heart of worship. And if you know it, feel free to sing along. Um, it goes like this. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that'll bless your heart and I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart and i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. And I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart so i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you. And I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's all about you, it's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you. Hi, I'm Pepper. I'm one of the leaders for Foundry Kids. So on our last Sunday that we met, we kind of had to pull an audible at the last minute on our lesson because we didn't have our normal group of kids that we have on a Sunday. So we kind of just thought we would put together a lesson at the last minute. Well, the kids on their own decided they wanted to make like happy cards for one of the area nursing homes. And I happen to be a physical therapist and work for the nursing home in Marouge, Oakwoods. So we try to really instill that, that Jesus is big enough. It's not just about us and like our immediate families or even the immediate church. It's about the entire community. So we try to get them involved in as many ways as we can. And so the kids all made these cards from the little kids up to the big kids and they wrote verses in them and I gave them to our activities director. 
And so she made a board and put them all on it and the residents have absolutely loved them. And something that's cool about our kids is our kids have a very giving spirit. They like to do things like this for the community. They like to make cards and make little projects and, and help out when they can. So I'm very proud of our Foundry kids. They brought some smiles to some residents that don't get to see very many people right now. So when you give to Foundry, you're not just giving to the local church, you're giving to the people in that church to help be able to provide to the community. And that includes people in your backyard, people in the nursing home in Maroon, to the whole entire community. Jesus is big enough and he lives in our neighborhoods. And now we're reading from 1 Peter 3 through 5 and 13 through 19. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who is called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. This is the word of God for the people of God. As a kid, there are these gr fantasies of a, a grand inheritance. You know the ones I'm talking about? The stories are usually like rags to riches or some other grandiose dream in the mind of a younger person. And we might have even thought about them ourselves. We had plans of, of what we would buy if we suddenly came into like Scrooge McDuck money, you know, swimming in massive piles of gold coins. I think I would either buy a go-kart when I was a kid or like the giant G.I. Joe aircraft carrier that always that also carried all your men in it. But as I grew older and I started to have family members begin to pass on, I started to understand what it meant for things to be passed down to me. And I think about it quite often, and the phrase I've used to describe it in my life is that my inheritance is typically old and rusty. I have countless tools from both of my grandfathers who are mechanics and from Meredith's grandfather who is quite the craftsman. And I've got books from family members that I use a lot and things I value. You also have like weird things, but they're all these, this stuff that I end up using uh, quite often. I'd estimate around half of the tools I use to accomplish uh, any project came from a family member to me after they passed. It's heavy to realize that you're using the same tools they did. And there are cultural expectations for inheritance, regardless of what it is. And my family, the idea is that we use the things that we have, that we allow the daily lives of those that we have dearly loved to continue to affect us in the life that we have now. They have deep value to us in unique ways. And as this week, as we continue our conversation in 1 Peter, focused on, on knowing who we are to God and how that changes the way we move in this world, this morning we're going to talk about a biblical idea of inheritance as it relates to belonging to God's people. But the center point of our conversation will be this, that the value of belonging is found in the action of belonging. In Scripture, we first find the language of inheritance as part of the promise to God's people in the book of Exodus. The land that God is bringing them into, who has promised their ancestors generations before them, and God is making good on his promise. It's the promise of possession. And this gift, and God makes it pretty clear in multiple times in Deuteronomy that this gift is to be seen this way, is given to them for their benefit and their goodness. 
And part of this gift is the fact that God's presence will dwell there as well and that they will have access to him. Then they aren't getting this inheritance because of rights or law, but a continual granting that is fulfilled by God and his faithfulness. And the only necessary action to the receiving party, to the people of God, is to respond in faithfulness. Jesus and the message of the New Testament expands this promise and he offers to us not land, but the coming kingdom of God, the riches of a life with God now and a life in the future. And we read these three things in 1 Peter. We find out that this inheritance is imperishable. It can't be corrupted and that it stands against death. We find out that this inheritance is undefiled, that it is pure. This is the language of sacrifice. But this inheritance is also unfading. It stays the same. It doesn't wear out or lose its character. It can't be overused. It doesn't have to be protected like I protect my favorite wrench from my grandfather. But in 1 Peter, we also see this inheritance language used to talk about salvation. If anything, it is talking about salvation. It isn't our action, but it's the actions of Jesus, the life that we are offered with him, and all of the fullness of its benefit is our inheritance. And this is a pass-down gift for our own benefit. What's really interesting, though, especially if we follow the logic that Peter is having here, is that the Romans held inheritance to be different than nearly anyone else in, in, in Bible times. Peter's writing to Roman Christians, and they hold this worldview. And in the Roman understanding of inheritance, unlike that of the Jews, of the Persians, of the Greeks, anyone around them, was that it wasn't naturally passed down to the next generation. That the person giving the inheritance had the ability to choose their own heir. And the language that Peter is using, it ends up, it's this language, it's the language of contracts. And it's a contract language for a person who's willfully accepted the inheritance of someone else who isn't their direct family. They're taking on the name of someone else. We find this uh, through the practice of Roman emperors quite often. And and Peter's uh, uh, readers and the hearers of this word would have understood this concept, would have seen this in the conversation Peter's having. And this isn't a conversation about bringing about, this isn't a conversation about belonging that we understand we're chosen by God. And that is our biggest identification. You know, we know that we are chosen by him to have the full benefit of everything that belongs to his son. And Jesus, the son of God, brings us into that relationship. Now, the key thing in this chapter of 1 Peter is the church recognizing and living into the benefit of belonging in the present day and here and now. But let me ask you this. If Peter's communicating about inheritance and about inheritance essentially meaning our salvation, how might we realize that our own passive understanding of of a future activation of of salvation, of of going to heaven, is simply deficient to our needs and our identification as God's people today. It doesn't mean that doesn't coming down the line, but that's not the only thing we have to look forward to. What does it mean for us to fully possess this inheritance now? You know, what does it mean uh, in our belonging, if our, our belongings activated, what does it mean to live into our salvation in a way that helps us understand the whole relationship of belonging to God? Peter also asks us to understand about the value of the gift we have. For 1 Peter 10, 1 through 12 also says this. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know about uh, this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance of Christ's suffering and the great glory afterward. Verse 12, they were told not that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by... And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is so wonderful that even the angels were eagerly watching these things happen. Our inheritance, our salvation is a treasure. And we have to treat it that way. The best example I know of understanding this is the fantastic 90s movie Billy Madison 
where Adam Sandler plays this spoiled rich guy who would not get his inheritance unless he made something of himself. So his dad made him go back to repeat school in this short span of time. His father wanted him to understand the value of what he was given. He had to be willing to activate a different level of being to truly understand and use the benefit of it. So how do we get into this? Verse 15 of, of, of our chapter says this, You shall be holy because I am holy. And this phrase occurs multiple times in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God wants his people not just to understand it in their minds, but to fully uh, take it in their hearts, this promised relationship and fulfillment. That this inheritance, it can't be touched or affected by the world in the way, in the way that our life can be now. And our own practices of drawing near to God begin to cause this chain reaction to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when I say the word holy or when I say holiness... I know that many times we can begin to get a little uncomfortable. We think about the do's and the don'ts. And in part, well, it is a conversation about the do's and the don'ts. But the motivation is different. And this is where I think we struggle with this so many times. We have lost the distinction of allowing ourselves to be conformed not to the world, but to the mind of Christ. Holiness means set apart, just like God is set apart. But it's an active holiness motivated by the internal decisions that we make to direct our behavior towards, uh, towards what causes the vision of God to grow in our eyes. It's not about what we don't do, but it's about what we intentionally do in our lives. Now, we sometimes struggle with the idea of biblical morality because we've lost the beginning point of the why of holiness. And we can't have emotional or spiritual maturity if we haven't woken up to our own spiritual birth into the family of God. The value of our belonging is found in the action of our belonging. It's that line from the old hymn, Come Thou Fount, where we sing, Tune our heart to sing thy grace. John Oswalt, uh, in his book, Called to be Holy, says this, Today, as we understand more and more about the complex causes of human behavior, we know that in order for God to change some of the things that we do, it may require a long process of revelation so that we understand why we are prone to certain things. Friends, holiness is about the journey, not the destination. And our belonging is found inside of this journey. Oswald also lists four necessary steps in the journey of holiness, in the journey of us understanding being made in the mind of Christ. The first one is this, that we must remember again that there is nothing we can do to make God love us more than he does at this moment. The second is this, that we must remember that the holy life is not about performance, but a new set of attitudes and a new way of responding to God's love. The third thing Oswald says is that we deal with failures that are real or perceived is to understand the difference between sin and the temptation to sin. That we allow the power of God to live in our lives where we become free from the willful decisions we used to make that kept us away from God. And we see and understand the value of that. The fourth thing that Oswald says is this, it's self-understanding that we realize our potential for Christ's likeness became ours upon accepting Christ. And that can now go on in our lives without any hindrance of an inner rebellion. John Wesley said that our hearts have been made perfect in holy love, that the power of Christ and our active holiness is us depending on the power of Christ and not depending on the power of ourselves and our just own sheer gumption to avoid doing things. Holiness is the journey, not the destination. And the value of our belonging is found in the activity of belonging. You know, our journey and our work to be like Jesus is the very thing that makes us like Jesus. And when we begin to understand this, we won't want to live in some like finger snap, instant heaven reality because we would have missed the benefit and the lessons learned and our quest to get there. Colossians chapter 1 says this. Verse 9 through 11. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. 
asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience and joy. It also says in verse 21, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you as holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The value of our belonging is found in the activity of belonging. That the promises of God are freely offered to us. And it's the journey of holiness that brings us towards a destination and allows us to live powerfully inside of it. You know, this week as I was uh, preparing just kind of like my final notes for this message, I sat down on Wednesday morning, which is my normal time to do this. And Wednesday morning, I always kind of finish and button up the sermon that I'm going to preach that Sunday. And, I, and my normal pattern before our life of, of quarantine and stay at home was to go to Dro Coffee uh, at Fiesta in Monroe. And I would get a cup of really good coffee and I would just make my final notes while drinking this cup of coffee. And since we've been home for the last six weeks, the one thing that I can control that was part of my, my normal rhythm of life before it is on Wednesday mornings about 9 o'clock, my normal time to do this, I make a really good cup of coffee at the house. I take my time and I go back to my office and I, I, I do the things I would be doing in my, in my normal previous life before COVID-19. But this week I just grabbed a coffee cup and I, I grabbed one just out of the cupboard and I realized that it was one of my things of inheritance. That it's grandfather's coffee mug. He was a Boy Scout scoutmaster of, uh, uh, outside of Omaha, Texas, and he was a leader among scouting in his entire area. And he served as a camp leader at Camp Dirks uh, for, for years. And he had a couple of these. And I remember from my childhood, my grandfather drinking out of these coffee cups. And so I sat there to, to finish up this message on spiritual inheritance, and I realized that I am holding something that belonged to someone who is different from me. And someone who I still pattern so much of my life after. I still ask myself the questions about how would he do things or what would he do. And I, I, I still, even though he's been dead for 15 years now, I still try to live my life in a way that I know he would be proud. That, um, that, that I want to make the most of the fact that I look like my grandfather and I laugh like my grandfather. And I have most of my grandfather's cowboy hats and a lot of his tools. And I just realized the irony of that and that we have been given something special. And as much as I value and treasure things like simple free coffee cups that are older than I am, we realize the treasure that Jesus gave us in our salvation. That it was something that people yearn for. And we've been given it. And we've been allowed to experience grace. And this grace in our lives should be an infusion of power where the love of God reigns, where the love of God affects us, and that we leave as, as beacons to the faithfulness and power and hope of God and go out into his world to testify to this glorious thing that has been given to us that allows us to belong to his family. So let's pray together. Father, wherever we are, if we're watching this live, if we're watching this streamed later after, God, thank you for letting us belong to you and for making that decision, for that being the way that you chose to operate in our world. And God, this morning, let us understand the power of your Holy Spirit that you want to send into our lives. But God, let us see the directions that we can go and the, 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 the cognitive and deliberate actions of holiness that we are called to place in our lives now. God, we want to be like you. And you have given us the tools to do just that. So God, we tune our hearts to sing your grace. May we place ourselves before you in intentional ways to live in the fullness of who you are. God, to to, to own the inheritance that has been graciously offered to us, to accept it freely and obediently. 
and to stand alive with it in mind. Thank you so much, Jesus. Let's show me pray. Amen. Thanks, and we'll see you all back next week.